Hey everyone, buildings, you know they're an essential part of our daily lives, right? Most of them look pretty much the same, but the buildings in today's video defy conventional design. That's because they're some of the most unusual looking buildings around. So join me for today's video. I'm going to explore 15 of the strangest buildings in the world. Number 15, Longaberger Basket Building. A tisket, a tasket, the longer burger basket. Okay, starting with a small shop in 1976 in Dresden, Ohio, Dave Longaberger began manufacturing market baskets based on the one he and his father made in a local factory during the Great Depression. Appreciation for the quality of the baskets fueled the demand and growth for the business, enough that he decided to build a home office for the company in 1995. But when it came time to design the office, he had a hard time thinking out of the basket. Construction on the home office was completed two years later in 1997. Today, the building resembles the medium market basket the company sells, though it's no longer used as Longenberger's corporate headquarters. Now it just stands as a monument to the odd building design. Though the company closed its doors for good in 2018 and has no plans to return, Longenberger is still a household name in Ohio, and not just because of the office building. At its peak in 2000, the Longenberger company employed more than 8,200 people, making it one of the primary employers in Dresden. Two large handles that are heated in the winter to avoid icing are attached to the building with replica copper and wooden rivets. Two tags adorn the building, similar to the ones on the real baskets, each with gold leaf tags measuring 25 feet by 7 feet and weighing 725 pounds. The building is illuminated at night and set amongst a 25-acre landscape site. After spending three years on the market, the big basket sold in January 2018 for $1.2 million. Whether or not the new owners will keep this kitschy facade intact is up for debate, but it will be a sad day when the Longaberger building comes down. Number 14, National Fisheries Development Board Building. All right, when we think of government offices, we immediately think of stale, boring, stuffy offices full of suits clicking away on their typewriters and drowning in paperwork. The typical government office is unremarkable and nondescript, its purpose unknown to the outside world. But this is so not the case with the National Fisheries Development Board in Hyderabad, India. Built in 2012, the giant fish-shaped building is just begging for attention as it seemingly swims in mid-air. Rectangular, scale-like windows puncture its silver body while a hollow mouth has been punched into the front and it has blue glass for eyes. Its address, according to Google, is simply the fish building. The three-story, 1920-square-meter structure was designed in this way by the Central Public Works Department of India for the simple reason that the work done inside relates to fishing. In a sense, it's quite similar to the Longaberger Basket Building. If you work with baskets, then make your building look like a basket. If you work with fish, then make the building look like a fish. This style of building where the structure is built in a form that mimics its function is known as mimetic architecture and was made popular in the U.S. in the early to mid-20th century. As highways and freeways were being built across the country, drivers began to notice hot dog restaurants in the shapes of dachshunds, coffee shops styled as giant cups, and donut-shaped stores selling donuts. It was a form of direct marketing that was easily seen by increasingly mobile Americans who were spending longer in their cars. So, I wonder if this fishy building in India is designed to reel people in hook, line, and sinker. Number 13. The Half House There's a halfway house, and then there's the half house. The lone row home at 54 and a half St. Patrick Street dates back to Toronto's slums in the late 19th century. Built between 1890 and 1893, this odd relic from a bygone era was one of six identical structurally intertwined homes on what was then known as Dummer Street. Time passed, the street names changed, and a greedy land holdings company began buying up property throughout the entire neighborhood in the middle of the 20th century. Eventually, the owners of the row houses caved, but not as a complete unit. Each half of the row house was torn down at an excruciatingly slow pace until 54 and a half remained the only one left. But how the hell was it carved so cleanly, so perfectly? Well, in a miraculous feat performed with clumsy and powerful machinery, a demolition crew managed to tear down 54 and a half's neighbor to the north with such precision as to not disturb any of the original facades on the building that was to remain. The exterior wall had once been a load-bearing wall hidden internally to divide the neighbor's bedrooms and living rooms from each other. One slip with an excavator and the half house would have come tumbling down. As of 2013, the house was reportedly to be privately owned and vacant. As it begins to show signs of wear, its status as a last bastion of the neighborhood is less pleasant days is beginning to show its craggy half-face. Despite the signs of wear and tear, there's no denying that this Canadian half-house has a lot of character. Number 12. El Nido de Quetzalcoatl 
Quetzalcoatl was the Aztec version of the feathered serpent god that permeated Mesoamerican mythologies. Though he originated as a vegetation god, Quetzalcoatl's role in Aztec mythology expanded over time. By the time the Spanish arrived in the New World, Quetzalcoatl was regarded as a god of wind, patron of priests, and inventor of calendars and books. He was also occasionally used as a symbol of death and resurrection. Nowadays, he's a series of condos in Naucalpan, Mexico. Well, Quetzalcoatl's nest is a winding snake-shaped structure that includes 10 separate apartments spread over 16,000 square feet. Designed by renowned Mexican architect Javier Senosian, the residence is an exploration of organic architecture that takes its design inspiration from nature and aims for minimal impact on the environment. Working on the irregular-shaped land, which is filled with caves and vast areas of oak trees, served as an inspiration for this real-life snake way, with an open cave serving as Quetzalcoatl's gaping maw. Despite the obvious addition of a massive snake house, the foliage and natural surroundings remain almost untouched by the complex. Quetzalcoatl would undoubtedly approve. The only alterations made were considered necessary for safety and construction, allowing Sinosian to stay true to his organic architecture ethic. The twisting walkways of Quetzalcoatl's nest provide some seriously spectacular views of the ravines and canyons, so long as you don't mind standing in the jaws of an Aztec snake god. The interior of the Quetzalcoatl's nest are equally as spectacular, offering guests a beautifully modern stay. Number 11. Edificio Mirador Postmodernism, it's given birth to some of the strangest architectural designs. The Edificio Mirador in Madrid, Spain definitely falls into that category. Looking like a giant Lego creation, the Edificio Mirador, or Lookout Building, is a 21-story, 208-foot-tall structure with a large rectangular opening built into it about 131 feet above the ground. It was designed by MVRDV, a Dutch architecture and urban design practice, and completed in 2005. The architects have said that instead of opting for the more traditional connected apartment blocks, they wanted to create many neighborhoods stacked around a sky plaza. Well, they certainly succeeded in that vision, and they succeeded in creating one of the world's strangest buildings. To give these vertical neighborhoods their own distinct character, the Edificio Mirador was built in nine distinct blocks, with each block containing a different type of compact housing aimed at integrating different social groups and lifestyles. To further differentiate the various small neighborhoods within the building, each block has a different facade, using one of a variety of materials such as stone slabs, mosaic tiles, and cement in various shades of gray, black, and white. This makes it easy to see the individual blocks from the outside of the building. The orange sections that can be seen on the exterior are access zones, and they were conceived as vertical alleyways connecting various areas of the neighborhood. And like any friendly neighborhood, the building has its communal outdoor area, like a small park in the heart of the building. The open-air sky plaza provides a communal space as well as views of the city and the mountains beyond. The only downside to the Edificio Mirador is that it sticks out like a sore thumb. Number 10. Kunsthaus Graz Standing in sharp contrast to the more traditional historic architecture of Graz, Austria, the Kunsthaus Graz Art Museum was designed to break out of the usual white box museum design. It certainly succeeded in this mission, and it looks like a strange UFO that landed on Earth and just refuses to leave. But then again, that's pretty much all of the modern art world in a nutshell. The modern museum was built in 2003, during the time when Graz served as the European capital of culture, an honor awarded to a different European city each year. Rather than install another bland box among the charmingly old buildings of the city, the designers went in completely the opposite direction, giving the building a more rounded, organic, yet otherworldly look with its bulbous shape and protruding skylight shafts. The gleaming surface of the museum is also embedded with nearly a thousand fluorescent rings that can be programmed to create different fun patterns, making the building even more spectacular and strange at night. Much of the structure's power is absorbed by solar panels on the gleaming roof of the building. Now, this playful building was designed by architect Sir Peter Cook and Colin Fournier. Cook famously co-founded Archigram in the 1960s, an avant-garde neo-futurist group of architects. Archigram inspired architects like Norman Foster, who designed the London City Hall, as well as designers of the Centre Pompidou in Paris. While the museum definitely stands out among the rest of Graz's uniformly historic buildings, it's now a beloved landmark of the city. Number 9. Mohammed bin Rashad Library what good is a city full of people if they can't go somewhere to learn? Well, Dubai has been building perhaps one of its coolest mega-projects yet. 
the Muhammad bin Rashad Library for the last few years. It was originally due to open in 2018, but by 2019 it was still under construction, with the main structure topping out in early 2020. But as of 2022, the library is open for business. For a library, this place is pretty extravagant, and if you miss it from the outside, then you better get your eyes checked, because the defining feature is that it's shaped like an open book. It's pretty cool. The library was built in Al Jadaf and already houses one and a half million books with another three million on the way. But if holding the physical copies just isn't your thing or if you want to save some paper, then they have another two million ebooks and one million audiobooks. Now, there have been about 130 million books ever written, so the Mohammed bin Rashad Library may have some catching up to do. But they seem to be doing a pretty good job so far. And aside from housing plenty of bookworms, the library is a venue for cultural and educational events and exhibitions, and even holds a 500-seat lecture hall. But perhaps more culturally significant is the fact that this library is the main headquarters of the International Council for the Arabic Language. That's awesome. Number 8. Haynes Shoe House There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. Could it have been this one? Malone N. Haynes was an eccentric and wealthy shoe salesman. He built his entire empire around his shoes, starting with the proceeds of his very first commission. And by 1948, at the age of 73, Haynes was a millionaire. What was left for him to do but build an homage to his greatest passion? At 25 feet long and 48 feet tall, the Haynes Shoe House is a simple structure of wood, wire, and cement stucco, with ornate stained glass windows. The Haynes Shoe House served as a three-dimensional interactive billboard of sorts for his Haynes Shoe Company. This piece of mimetic architecture alerted those driving by that if they needed a new pair of shoes while out on the road, this was the place to do it. A simple pair of work boots was just $1.98 at the time, but the shoe house has become so much more than an ad. Haynes would generously open up the doors and the laces of this unique structure to the elderly and newlyweds to spend free vacation time. Any couple married in a town that had a pair of his shoes is welcome to stay at the shoe house on an all-expenses paid visit, which included a maid, a cook, a chauffeur, and an automobile at their disposal. Talk about a nice guy. The shoe house has passed through the hands of many different owners and even served a stint as an ice cream shop. It's been renovated to portray the look and feel of old Americana and holds a museum of the eccentric life of Mr. Malone and Haynes. Needless to say, this shoe house has a lot of soul. Number 7. The Cube Houses all right, try not to hurt your eyes looking at this next strange building. Hanging high in the air and weaving their way in and out of themselves, Rotterdam's string of cube houses, each tilted at an abnormal angle of 55 degrees, have left a kink in the neck of every passerby. In 1970, the city planners of Rotterdam in the Netherlands had a problem. Small pieces of land on both the northwest and southwest sides of Block Street were zoned as residential, but they had to be somehow connected. Looking for an outside-of-the-box thinker, the city consulted with architect Piet Blom to devise a way to build a housing complex as a bridge over the road. Blom's answer was the cube house. With 38 regular cube houses and two super cubes, each tilted cubic residence is held up by a hexagonal pillar, some of which are located atop a pedestrian bridge spanning the four-lane block street. While it solved the urban planning problem, it also created some highly interesting residences in the process. Living in the cube is much like an experience on a sailboat, and if you don't catch your bearings, then get ready for some vertigo. Each cube contains about 1,080 square feet of floor space. A staircase takes residents up to the first floor where there's a triangle-shaped room with a living space, dining area, bathroom, office, and kitchen. A second flight of stairs takes you up two bedrooms and a bathroom and a loft area. Most of the cubes have doors on the second floor that connect to one or two other cubes via a small terrace. The homes as a whole are a registered monument of the city of Rotterdam and have become an unmistakable landmark. Number 6. Odeo Solar Furnace The world's largest solar furnace is located in Font Romeo Odeo Villa, a commune in the sunny Pyrenees Mountains on the French-Spanish border. The furnace consists of a field of 10,000 mirrors, or heliocaminus, which bounce the sun's rays onto a large concave mirror. A heliocaminus is simply a glass-enclosed room meant to focus and heat the room, much like a modern sunroom. The principles behind the modern solar furnace haven't changed much from these sunrooms and burning lenses. Each of the heat-seeking mirrors measures 21 feet and 3 inches by 23 feet 11 inches, giving a total area of 30,000 square feet. 
The mirror focuses the enormous amount of sunlight onto an area roughly the size of a cooking pot, which reaches temperatures above 5400 degrees Fahrenheit. The solar furnace itself isn't exactly new. The first modern solar furnace was built in Mont Louis in 1949 by Professor Felix Tomba, and the current one was constructed in 1970. However, the solar furnace generates a beam of focused sunlight as powerful today as it was 3,000 years ago when the ancient Greeks, Celts, and Egyptians learned to harness its power. Number 5. Nakagin Capsule Tower The Nakagin Tower, constructed in 1972 and part of the so-called Metabolus architecture spearheaded by Kishio Kurakawa of Japan, is perhaps the most famous building that sprang out of these social experiments. The building follows the axioms of the metabolist philosophy. It consists of two separate towers which serve as a support to 140 prefabricated capsules. Each capsule is one self-contained tiny little apartment. The original idea postulated that capsules could be eventually replaced by newer models, keeping living standards in the building constantly up to date. The original target demographic was the bachelor salaryman. The capsules were fully furnished with an up-to-the-minute fashion, including such amenities as a kitchen stove, a refrigerator, a television set, and a reel-to-reel -reel tape deck. While it does certainly have a unique look to it, the capsule tower turned out to be an unbearable thing to its inhabitants. Tiny apartments measuring 8 feet by 12 feet by 7 feet were constantly cramped and a giant concrete shell was ugly and dehumanizing. In addition, maintenance costs started to pile up, and the value of the real estate in the center of the famous and expensive Ginza district began to plummet. In April of 2007, the odd building was slated for demolition, causing an uproar in the international architecture community. Kurakawa led the campaign for its preservation until the end of his life. He even suggested the replacement of the original capsules with a smaller number of more spacious modules. The financial crisis provided only temporary salvation for the building as investors for the replacement haven't been found yet. However, by 2014, the Save the Nakajin Capsule Tower project began crowdsourcing funds to buy the tower's capsules and secure voting rights against the tower's demolition. Number 4. The Dancing House there's no dancing around the next strange building on this list. While the building was known as the Tanchichi Doom, co-architect the world-renowned Frank Gehry dubbed it Fred and Ginger, calling to mind the elegance and wit of the famous film couple. Some local residents, not so enamored with the radical design, dubbed it the Drunk House, seeing as how it looked like the building may have had one too many. Completed in 1996, it took four years to build the dancing house. It sits on land that fronts the river, surrounded by imposing 18th and 19th century architecture, standing out like a crooked sore thumb. The previous building on the lot was destroyed during the bombing of Prague in 1945, during the final days of World War II. It sat in a shattered state until the rubble was finally cleared away in 1960, and it took another 30 years before new life was breathed into the corner lot. Gary originally referred to the structure as Fred and Ginger. It was hard enough in the early 90s for locals to accept a deconstructionist vision for the otherwise Romanesque, Baroque, Gothic, and Neo-Renaissance capital of Chechia, without then slapping an American name on top of it. So Fred and Ginger was dropped, and in the end, most everyone seems to have accepted the Dancing House. A more formal acceptance of the building can be seen in a form of a gold coin issued by the Czech National Bank in 2005 in a final series called 10 Centuries of Architecture. Number 3. The Atomium In 1958, the Atomium was built for the Brussels World Fair. While it was never intended to be a permanent part of the Brussels landscape, like the Eiffel Tower for the French, once the fair was over, the local population wanted to keep the giant structure. Essentially, the Atomium is a 335-foot-tall giant iron crystal replicated in shiny steel. The Atomium is formed by nine spheres arranged in the shape that iron atoms take in their delta and alpha allotropes. The Atomium is magnified 165 billion times the normal size of an iron crystal. Designed by Andre Waterkin, one of the original ideas has been to build an upside-down version of the Eiffel Tower, but in keeping with the 1950s Atomic Age theme, they built the Atomium. It was recently renovated and all but three of the steel spheres are available to enter and contain everything from exhibition space to a restaurant to a place for school children to have sleepovers. Equally odd is the nearby Mini Europe, a theme park featuring miniature replicas of European monuments. Number 2. Montreal Biosphere The World's Fair is a great excuse to build uniquely funky buildings, and the Montreal Biosphere is no exception. 
As their contribution to Montreal's 1967 World's Fair Exposition, the United States government commissioned the brilliant architect and scientist Buckminster Fuller to design a pavilion for the Canadian exhibition. Fuller, who popularized, perfected, and named the Geodesic Dome, designed a 20-story tall dome in the fashion of his hallmark design to represent the United States. Built in a full two-thirds sphere rather than the typical half dome, the massive steel structure was seen and admired by over 5.6 million visitors who went into the dome to see exhibits from actual spaceships from the Apollo missions to American works of art. The biosphere steel skeleton was fitted with clear acrylic covering and making the structure look like a massive jewel glittering in the sun. And when the fair ended, the pavilion remained. The dome was originally meant to be bolted together, allowing the pavilion to be dismantled when the fair came to a close, but budget constraints led to workers to weld the dome together instead, forever securing the dome's place in Montreal's landscape. The sphere would remain open to the public for nine years, until an accident involving some routine welding maintenance caused the acrylic covering to catch fire, engulfing the entire sphere in a spectacular ball of fire with flames that burned for half an hour. When the flames died, there was no sign of the acrylic walls to be seen, but the steel trusses of the dome remained. After this horrific incident, the dome was closed to the public for over 15 years. Like the Phoenix, the dome rose from the ashes in 1995 and was repurposed as a museum devoted to environmental action. The new and improved biosphere sported no acrylics on its exterior over this time around due to the cost keeping the gigantic dome warm and cool, and most likely to prevent future accidents. However, the dome was hit with another disaster in 1998, when an ice storm forced the biosphere to close for five months. The biosphere reopened once again and still houses the museum. Through the fire and Canadian ice storms, the biosphere of Montreal remains a sturdy and beautiful example of geodesic architecture. Number 1. The Interlace The Interlace in Singapore takes the crown for being the strangest building in the world. While it may just be an apartment complex, the structure is a vertigo and nausea-inducing piece of work, with many sections looking ready to fall at a moment's notice. The interlace has 1,040 units just between Queenstown and Bekut Mira, and a stark departure from the typical high-rises built in highly populated cities. In fact, the interlace resembles Jenga blocks all irregularly stacked on each other. Designed by the Office for Metropolitan Architecture, it was awarded the Urban Habitat Award in 2014 and the World Building of the Year title at the 2015 World Architecture Festival. Despite how it may look to the untrained eye, the interlace has been praised by many in the architectural community. The wacky and wild 610,000 square foot complex sits on 20 acres of land and consists of six story blocks in hexagonal arrangements surrounding eight courtyards. The blocks are stacked four high at the center to provide a maximum of 24 floors. This provides almost every home with a wide view of the surrounding areas. It has a total of 31 residential blocks, with units ranging in size from 800 square feet to 6,300 square feet for the penthouses. I'll see you guys next time. Watch our binge-watching playlist if you'd like to watch all of our most popular top 15 videos. Grab a drink, grab a snack, and get ready to binge. The Top 5 Show has launched channel memberships. Thank you to our channel members.